Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Dairy Girls Season 3, Episode 6. In this episode, Sarah finds out that she accidentally got engaged. And we have some really great stuff happening for poor Claire. And we have some really bad stuff. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you so much to Ashley for commissioning this episode. Um, y'all, this was, this is rough. This is one of those where I just like, I saw the, the, I don't even know why I'm starting there. I'm not going to start there. I'm going to start at the beginning, the way the episode starts, which is with the very hilarious accidental engagement. Let's begin there. Sarah is over here. It's, it, it's a week before Halloween as this episode begins. And I was pretty excited to see how this went because I know that other countries don't celebrate Halloween the way the U S does. Let's be frank. Nobody celebrates anything the way the U S does because we are the absolute like Kings, global Kings of capitalism. If we can make more money off of anything we will like suddenly force it into being a thing. So naturally we have just started Halloween in August at this point, And it just carries on to the point where by the time Halloween finally rolls around, everybody's sick of it. <clears throat> not me, not me, but I'm just saying. So I was a little bit curious, like what it was going to look like. But we don't actually get all that much of the Irish Halloween in this episode. There is a little bit of like outdoor decor and they're talking about it on the radio and stuff. And it turns out that there's a yearly parade that happens. I'm so sorry, guys. My throat is just, <clears throat> it just keeps doing that frog thing. Um, now, this is one of those that I'm, I'm super jealous of. I feel this way, even though I know that we have one. I love the concept of living in a town that does up holiday events. But the truth is I live in a fairly small town and fairly, I mean, you know, it's like 15,000 people, but that's not that big really when you stop and look at it. And we do have a Halloween parade, but it's never on my radar. I have started following all of these like local pages on Facebook so that I don't miss things. And I still, because of the way the algorithm works, unless I go to their page and look for it, I don't see them. But it turns out we have all sorts of things. We have Halloween and Christmas parades. We're going to have like fireworks for New Year's this year. I don't know if that's been a thing every year, but I sure don't remember it. And there's been a couple of like big, uh, there's, there's a weekly Saturday morning farmer's market. That's like in an indoor area that I just found out about. So I wish so much that the way I interacted with the, you know, parade in my town was as active as it is in this town. And like, I really wonder if these sorts of local events took a hit after the advent of the internet and smartphones, because so many people just sort of detached from their like local area events and began to do a lot of things like online, or they would hear about bigger events that were further away and they would make a journey to go to something outside of their hometown instead. And also there's the aspect of like going to a hometown thing here 
it doesn't carry the same weight for me because I don't know a lot of people in our town. I didn't grow up here. And Owen did, but most of the people that he's friends with have moved away. So there's also that aspect of it that like in this, we've got a lot of people who grew up here and settled and had kids here also. And so there's, you know, generations who all are familiar with one another. And there's just going to be a very different dynamic when you go to this sort of event. So anyway, I just always see this sort of thing. It's it's the same thing as like watching one of those like Hallmark Christmas movies. And there's some big like Christmas fair that's going to happen in the center of the town with amazing decorations and this really cool Santa and all this stuff. And I'm always just like, man, I I would like that to be real. And like, it is real, but it's not the same because I don't know anybody here. Anyway, so that's being mentioned at the beginning of this. And they're talking about the uh, because the radio show asked for people to call in with the name of the original Celtic name for the festival. And Sarah is saying that this guy would know because he is one of the ancient Celts. And Mary is like, you mean he plays for the Celtics? And she's like, yeah, that's what I said. Um, but Jerry comes in. He opens a piece of mail and shrieks Jesus Christ and his wife repeats this because it turns out it is an invitation to an engagement party for Sarah and Karen is that how you say his name Sierra I can't remember if it's a hard C or it's a C I A R A N I think is how you spell it but I can't remember how they pronounce it in the show um but regardless This is the same guy who, like, tried to take her hand to go dance and she just handed him her plate last episode, I think. And I can't recall, guys, but is he also the one who told her that she had a smashing clavicle when she was, like, at the mall, I think was that? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like, I think that was in the first season. Somebody complimented Sarah's clavicle and that was just, like, the way to her heart and she crumpled immediately. But anyway... I love the way this scene goes because what happens is that they're trying to ask her what the fuck is going on here. And it's such a roundabout conversation. Jerry approaches it wrong. To be fair, Jerry comes at her with the, is there something that you want to tell us? Which if you are talking to a person like Sarah, you just never want to give them that big open ended question to begin with. You need to get very specific but she starts talking about how she's thinking about going blonde and I truly cannot if emphasize enough what a bad idea I think that is, Sarah. She says something about like, because they're like, no, that's not it. And she's like, I know what you're going to say, that it's going to wash me out. Look, that's not what they were going to say, Sarah, but I, it is what I'm going to say. It will wash you out. Don't do it. Girl, don't do it. I have literally had nightmares that I bleached my hair blonde and I have bleached my hair in order to dye it purple and whatnot. I have done that. So I know whereof I speak with how it looks when it's blonde. And when I say blonde, that's that's got a real asterisk after it because it's really orange. You know, there are times where it gets to like a yellow, but it's always a very yellow yellow. It's never good. Um, But Sarah's got very dark hair and it's just I just don't think it would work out. I'm just don't do it, girl. I should also mention, too, that in the midst of the scene, Sarah has a cigarette that she's lit and she's like holding and then she puts it down and there's like smoke streaming up a couple times. And I appreciate there being a smoker in this show because I feel like that is something that really is a good reminder of the era that we're in here. And that is not to say that people don't smoke anymore. Like obviously Rashawn's a smoker. I have several friends who are smokers, but the casually smoking in the house with a lot of people who don't smoke, that is much less often seen than it used to be because it's, it's been made so much more clear how dangerous it is for folks. And I think that the fact that it is dangerous has made it so that those of us who just didn't like it, never mind the health consequences, we just found it gross, 
we feel a little bit more confident in speaking up and being like, hey, no, not in here. Go outside with that, you know, at the very least, because I don't want my home to smell like it, but also I don't want to be around it. Um, but it's just remarkable to me how much seeing a, like a lit cigarette in the scene takes me personally back in time a little bit because my grandmother was a smoker and it was part of the whole like energy of her house was the smell of cigarette smoke very like low level because she often smoked outside because she didn't care for the smell of it inside and it's it's just I am not really around anybody on the daily who smokes anymore it's I just I'm not, you know, so there's just, it's just a funny thing to see that and just be like, wow, yeah, no, this is definitely like the nineties. You can tell because of the cigarette. It's a weird thing when they still exist. Smokers are, are out there. But anyway, they are trying to get her to fucking look at the invitation because the thing that she says is that. I'm going to go see Bjorn on that day. I'll have to give this a miss. And she doesn't look at what the event is. She just looks at the date. And f and the first thing that she says is, why is that date familiar? And Jerry says, gee, I wonder, thinking that it's because that's when she agreed to have the party. And then we find out that's not even what it is. She's going to a, a Bjorn concert, which uh, apparently they're like an ABBA novelty act. I have never heard of them. Um, at first, I thought she said Bjork. So when he says something about like an ABBA act, I was very confused. And then I realized, oh, no, no, different, different name. Um, but what they eventually when she like realizes that it's a engagement party she just says oh i think i know what happened there and then goes back to like selecting a nail polish color and everybody is like and and i have you ever met somebody like this i have met i i, I think two people in my life that really do not know how to tell a story and it's tempting to look at somebody behaving like this and think they're fucking with you because it's so the, the reactions they're having and the way they tell the story makes no logical sense to you so you might be like are they just trying to get attention like or draw out the drama but no they genuinely their brain has already moved forward with, oh, I figured out the solution. And they have utterly forgotten. They didn't say it out loud. Nobody else in the room knows what's happening. And sometimes they will start, they will say something because they have moved on mentally. That is a complete non sequitur. And I don't know if that's like, you know, part of uh, being neurodivergent or having ADHD. I guess that is being neurodivergent, isn't it? But you know what I'm saying? Um, I, it's always so frustrating to me, especially like I am kind of, when I get a story out of somebody, I want them to tell me literally what the other person said and what they literally said as close to word for word as I can get it. I do not like stories that are like, well, you know, he gave me this ring and I, I guess I just didn't realize what it was for. That's not, to be fair, the way she tells it. But that is the way a lot of folks I know tell stories. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Back up. He just pulled the ring out and handed it to you? No, he said something. Tell me what he said and how you responded. Uh, t storytelling is an art, even if it's just like a verbal gossip type story. It doesn't matter. You still have to like pace things and know what to do. So anyway, it turns out that she was like, <laughs> she had gone to some like jazzercise class and he picked her up and uh, she wanted to go like get something to drink because she was super thirsty she says something like, I had a mouth like Gandhi's sandal, mouth flopping like Gandhi's sandal. I 
I guess it's just meant to be that, be, like, those are essentially, like, flip-flops? Is that what she means? Like, I don't think I've ever heard the term mouth flopping for being thirsty, although I get, like, it's pretty evocative, the term. But it did catch me off guard, that, like, idiom. I was like, what? Is that a, is that something? Or is that just Sarah? And he said I, he had a better idea. And I love this moment. And then he whipped out. And Joe immediately sits down and says, what? What did he whip out? And she opens this uh, ring box and says this. And it's this like sapphire ring encircled by diamonds. And asked if he would, if I would do him the honor of accepting it. And I did, even though it would limit my nail polish choices, which I, you guys know how much I fucking love Sarah and this is such a real thing that I dealt with when I picked out my engagement ring, which I do not have on now because I tend to not wear it as much in the house um, because it gets caught on things. And also with the dogs, I just have like a paranoia about it. But it's a purple stone. It's an amethyst. And I had such like misgivings about getting a colored stone. I was thinking maybe I should do something that's more neutral to go with everything. And... Uh, Anyway, she apparently did not interpret it as an engagement ring, which, to be fair, it doesn't sound like he actually made a speech or asked her to marry him. He just said, do me the honor of accepting it. Now, I will give a caveat and say, I am not certain I should trust Sarah's version of events. She is a pretty unreliable narrator in a lot of ways. So it may be that there was a whole thing that went along with this and she simply like left that out of her telling of the story. But he is such an awkward guy that I wouldn't be surprised if he handled this in a kind of like passive way that wasn't really clear. Um so regardless, he took this as her accepting the engagement and I cannot get over that this man just decided that he was going to like make a date for their engagement party and send out the invites and not talk to her about it. That's my favorite part of this. And I mean, honestly, he's obviously way more into her than, than she is into him. And she also is like so flaky and flighty that it would make sense to me a little bit if he was the one that took control of a lot of the planning aspects. But uh, it would be amazing if they genuinely were engaged and she just was like, babe, I'm going to see Bjorn that night. I'm not coming to our engagement party. I'm so sorry. Because she just strikes me that this would not be a major priority. Um, although I say that, and if she were actually into him enough to agree to marry him, Probably Sarah enjoys attention, you know, so probably she would be pretty keen to be there for her engagement party because it's going to be about her. I bet she looks amazing in white. I uh, I don't know if that's what she would wear, but I bet it would look really good on her. Um, anyway, so it the, what this leads to eventually is... Her convincing Jerry, oh my God, Austin says, we saw her in white at that wedding last season. I don't remember. Did she wear white to a wedding? Oh, this bitch. I love her. Oh, I love her so much. Um, I don't remember that, but did I say she looked really good in it? I bet I did. <laughs> Reminds me of that office episode. And I think it's Kelly. And she's just like, there was an emergency. And then when they interview her, she just says, I look really good in white. And she does, to be fair. Um, oh, yes. And she came slowly down the aisle. Oh, my God. I forgot. God, I love her. I love her so much. She and I would be, would definitely be friends. I would get infuriated with her so much. But if I had Mary there. At least I could commiserate with her and just, we could just exchange glances over Sarah's head and just be like, okay, sweetie. Um, so <laughs> what she convinces Jerry to do, because she doesn't want to take the time to dump this guy, 
And I am so embarrassed for him for the fact that like she is prioritizing doing her Halloween makeup over breaking off an engagement and breaking this poor man's heart. But she wants Jerry to do it. When he says he won't, Joe offers to do it. And he says that basically he will beat the hell out of this guy. And earlier when she's explaining how there was a misunderstanding, Joe defends her saying these men, they only hear what they want to hear. I don't feel like I give Joe enough credit for how readily he supports his daughters because often it comes at the price of, of shitting on Jerry, which I can't approve of because Jerry is a sweetie. But honestly, the fact that Joe is so ready to take up for them at the drop of a hat, it's, it's like, yeah, a little toxic. Sure. But honestly, it's like the ideal, like you want a parent who's on your side all the time, you know, and I know that it's not really a healthy thing. You need a parent who's going to be like, well, maybe you were at fault a little here, babe. Like that's, the, that's the actual healthy thing. But I just adore his energy of being ready to throw down at the drop of a hat with literally anybody who crosses them. It's just, and especially the way he says they hear what they want to hear. Is the man wrong? Fucking no, he is not wrong. That's the thing. So as much as I'm just like, well, I, I'm very sure that's not really how it went here. I also am like, but Joe, you're not, your heart's uh, in the right place with this one, you know? But anyway, Jerry then is like, I can't. I, I, you're going to like let this poor dude get beat up by your father to which Sarah says, and to think you could have prevented it. Unbelievable. Oh, actually I think it's Mary that says that, but it puts him in the position. And I, I really do enjoy how Jerry is so often left holding the bag. Oh, this poor guy. So, they sit this dude down. <laughs> Joe is sitting there with this Frankenstein mask on. And uh, Saren has to ask, like, he's just like, I'm having trouble concentrating. Jerry's like, I understand it has to tell him to take it off. And Joe is so petulant. He yanks it off the way like a teenager would take off his baseball hat in a class when the teacher takes him. Like, just so begrudgingly and snotty. And... As Jerry is attempting to let him down easily, Joe is over here, the, like, just chiming in, like, the Greek chorus with the most brutal version of what Jerry is attempting to say. And eventually, when he says, she's the love of my life, Joe just says, well, you're not hers. And finally, Siren stops and is like, what does he mean? And as they're about to tell him it was just a misunderstanding, here comes Sarah in a full habit. And we saw Sister Michael earlier in the episode posting that people could rent the nun's habits and that they make a fucking killing on Halloween. So that's what uh, Mary and Sarah did. And they mention overpaying, which I have no doubt they did. For a good cause, a European vacation. Um, but he thinks, because it hasn't been spelled out yet, that she is breaking off the engagement because she has decided to like enter the church. And this strikes me as an extremely temporary measure. Like, they see this dude fairly often. I have to assume it's going to become pretty clear pretty quickly that she didn't become a nun. And then what? I don't know how, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just, I, I am willing to accept for the sake of the show that this is just like going to work. 
But it felt like the sort of thing where you're going to have to come up with like an additional backstory for this to to continue to hold. Especially like he's picking her up from from jazzercise practice. She breaks off the engagement here and he is, I am assuming, taking it for granted that this just means that they aren't going to be seeing each other anymore. But is she going to start dating again? Like, I I just feel like this could very much backfire. But anyway, it is a nice out. It's a beautiful moment, too, where she says, like, you're not angry with me, are you? In her habit, with her hands clasped to her chest. And finally, he says, no, of course not. You know, a calling is a calling. And she says, God bless. And I don't think in that moment that she understands what he thinks is happening. I think that she has forgotten entirely how she's dressed and what it looks like to him. And so when she's saying all of this, it just happens to really line up with what they're telling him. But yeah, I, uh, this was, this actually kind of reminded me of like an episode of cheers or something. It was that kind of amusing where I'm like, I don't really buy it, but I'm, I'm willing to suspend my disbelief because it does work so well in the moment. And also I just don't want this poor guy to get his feelings hurt because he does seem like as much as he is definitely kind of a weirdo, he seems like a nice enough dude and he seemed to really like Sarah. So I don't want him to have his poor heart crushed into pieces, although probably it still will be. But it's different to think that she has been overwhelmed by her spiritual, like, desire to commune with the Lord. Then she just doesn't like me that much. You know, one of those feels a lot more dignified than the other. So... Um, but yeah, so that's how they wind up handling this. And uh, then we have like the scene ending with the phone call that Jerry gets. So now let's back up and go back again to the beginning of the episode when Aaron and Orla walk in. And this is a wild thing. Aaron said... Don't you remember that I, you told me I could have my birthday money early if it were a good enough reason. And when Mary says, I never said that, here we've got Orla in the background and she has a talk boy that she recorded Mary saying this on and presses play and it's Mary's voice saying the exact thing. It's all queued up and ready to go. And this y'all know, or maybe you don't, but now you do. I'm a home alone head. I don't know what you would call it, but I am a big fan of this fucking movie. Home alone to me is one of the few movies out there who <laughs> Austin is suggesting a home alone -y. I'm a home alone -y. Yeah, that might work. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm going to workshop it. That's a, that's a top of the list though. I will say <laughs> I'm a home alone homie. I'm a homie alone -y. Oof, I'm going too far. I'm sorry guys. But, um, I, th it's to me like one of those movies that will, really withstand the test of time there is next to nothing problematic in the movie there is a very classic sort of like uh look to all of the decor and everything so that yeah you can tell it's the 90s from a lot of different like indicators but it's so divorced from anything very very specific that it doesn't feel like you're going back in time in a serious way. And the plot is so tightly constructed. There are very few plot holes. I mean, if any, um, and just a really great acting and a storyline that is simultaneously fun and hilarious and manages to have like genuine arcs for characters and stuff. I find that movie 
pretty much flawless. And then there's Home Alone 2, which is a goddamn disaster. That movie, and I will still watch it. Don't get me wrong. I don't watch it every year. I watch Home Alone at least once every Christmas, sometimes like several times. The year that I moved here uh, to live with Owen, it, I moved down on December 10th. And I watched it four times that Christmas time because I watched it at home with my mom. I watched it on the plane. I watched it when I got here. And then we watched it like again. Um, the second movie is the one where he has the talk boy. And the, t the second Home Alone movie is, and look, I'm not going to get into it like a big thing, but here's the problem. And you can actually see. Do you see this, guys? I have the Home Alone uh, illustrated book behind me, and I have pop dolls of Marv and, uh, oh my God, what's the other one's name? Y'all know what I'm talking about. And and Kevin McAllister. Harry, thank you, Ms. T. Home Alone 2 is almost as good. Absolutely fucking not, Ms. T. And here is why. Home Alone 1 works, and when I say it's flawless and has like no holes in it, the reason it works is because they give kevin very good reasons to not get in touch with anybody he thinks his family has genuinely disappeared due to magical reasons he thinks he got rid of them like he blames himself and is asking for santa to bring them back because he has regret and he shoplifts by accident so he doesn't want to go to the cops because he thinks he's going to be in trouble because as a kid he has no idea of the proportion of this and there are robbers that are trying to break in one of whom posed as a cop so there's also the potential to think that maybe like this dude is corrupt and in on it somehow and there's also a very scary old man outside and so he doesn't feel comfortable going to neighbors and also the neighbors most of them aren't there broken power lines are, are making phone calls impossible blah 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 all of this stuff adds up to a very believable i am not reaching out and nobody can get to me home alone 2 is horseshit because the only reason he gets separated from his family is he wants to put batteries in his talk boy, which his father tells him, just do it on the plane, dude. We're running late and he won't wait. So he stops, puts the batteries in, looks up, sees what he thinks is his dad with the same coat, follows him onto the wrong plane, and he winds up in New York while his family is in Florida. He knows where he was supposed to be. And he knows he got on the wrong plane. He could go to literally anybody and be like, I got on the wrong plane. This is my name. This is my parents' name. They are in Florida. But does he? No. He takes his father's credit card and forges his signature and steals his identity to charge up rooms at the fucking hotel and never tells anyone what is going on, even though he fully knows, which is the difference to me between a very sympathetic character in the first movie. You're rooting for Kevin. Everybody's shitting on him in the first act and Buzz is such a dick to him. And even though he is a brat, when he throws his tantrum, you're kind of like, I kind of get it. And he is genuinely just doing his best when he finds out he's by himself. But Home Alone 2, Kevin, is just an asshole. He is just a dick. And he just genuinely is like trying to kill these men eventually. It is bad. So... It just is, it's a whole different dynamic because it, there's no magic. There's no believable reason why he wouldn't reach out for help. And the whole fact that like, there's a guy at the front desk who's trying to nail him for fraud. This man who is played by Tim Curry, this man is genuinely so excited about taking down a fucking child Sir, how about you find out what the deal is with this kid who's like guardians you have never set eyes on? How about you stop being like gleeful about him and calling the cops on him and start to actually extend a little bit of empathy and find out what the fuck this, sir, will not stand. <laughs> Missy in the chat. 
ma'am, this is a Dairy Girls episode. I'm so sorry. All you had to do was show me the talk boy and that was it. I was off. The talk boy did not come out until after the movie. And I had thought for, or no, yes. And I wanted one so bad. You guys, the talk boy slows down your voice, speeds up your voice. You can do all these like silly little effects with it. I don't blame my parents for not getting me one because frankly, I bet it would have been fucking torture. Oh my God. I mean, you, you all know I'm a woman who likes the sound of her own voice. That's what I do. And as a child, as much as I was like very introverted around people I didn't know at home, I was quite a little chair box. So I bet this would have been real, real bad. But I was so excited to find out that there they actually exist. And they came out like a while after. The talk boy, I think a lot of us watching the movie thought they were already a thing and that this was like product placement. And not so. The movie came out and the talk boys didn't drop for sale until like, I feel like it was six months later. It was like long enough that I was sort of surprised that they bothered. And uh, anyway, I'm super jealous of Orla. To this day, I wouldn't mind having a talk boy. I wouldn't use it. I know I wouldn't, but it's just the concept. And the, the fact that she uh, has this on tape and that she can look at her mother and Mary is like, oh my God, are you kidding? And fucking Aaron is so smug. And Sarah's response is Jesus, but Home Alone 2 has a lot to answer for. <laughs> Oh my God. She says something about that time we were slagging off Deirdre Mallon's pelmet. It's all on there. What the hell is a pelmet? It doesn't match her tie backs, Jerry. Tie backs, I'm thinking, are for curtains, but I don't know what a pelmet is. Um, Austin says, related to this, I love having text conversations save with my mother because I can pull up to show she did slash did not say something. Look, this is a major perk of texts. Uh, also a downfall for some people, but I, as somebody who has basically like photographic memory, and when I say that, I don't know what, what do you call it when you can remember conversations almost verbatim? That's not to say that I'm not occasionally wrong because I, I sure can be, but I tend to have a really good memory of verbal conversations. And then I will have a talk with Owen and he will act like I have fucking invented things. And I'm like, not only did you say that, I remember the tone. I remember what you were eating. I remember where we were sitting. And you're over here acting like I just am making it up. Like, that's just insulting. So texts is a great way to be able to just be like, <clears throat> actually. It's also part of uh, figuring out how to do screenshots. God, what a godsend screenshots are. Because y'all remember when that wasn't a thing quite yet. And then when you figure out how to do those and you can just save shit before people can delete. <laughs> that, that is the thing about Twitter that I love the most is that you tweet anything as a celebrity and there are people just screenshotting it, even if it doesn't seem important. Because they don't know what could be and couldn't be important. Perhaps it will be an issue later. And they fucking save that shit. Anyway, um, Miss T says total recall. I guess that would be it, huh? It just makes me think of the movie. But yeah, all right. So anyway, they are having this Halloween concert. And it turns out it's 20 quid each. And Fat Boy Slim is playing. Now... Y'all, can I be honest with you? Punk Soul Brother starts playing. They play a few of his songs. I recognized all of his songs. However, when I tell you I had no idea that this man was just a DJ, I didn't know anything about him. Like, that we're seeing him in silhouette a bunch of places, and it's just i genuinely nothing none of this is ringing any bells it is all news to me basically i think that i had somehow conflated like 
Fat Boy Slim with the guy from uh, Smash Mouth somehow because that who that's like vaguely who I'm picturing in my head when I think of the name. Just I I couldn't believe once they started to like show him in articles and stuff like that how utterly new it all felt. I had no clue. Um, Austin says, as a young person, I did not realize Fat Man Slim was big in the 1990s. You mean Fat Boy Slim. Austin, you're worse than me, babe. (laughs) I thought it was supposed to be a joke. They were excited for him at first. (sighs) Yeah. Look, we got excited about some weird shit in the 90s. Not me in terms of like music so much. I was never that big into like current music, but uh, I look at some of the stuff that took off and genuinely questionable really was. Of course, we had the Spice Girls a couple episodes ago and that was valid completely. So, you know, sometimes we were right, but (laughs) I, I just really was so out of touch with my own generation when it comes to music. And I think it's being raised by a mother who was like very young when she had me um anyway so i really got to get moving on this they go buy the tickets and they're they buy the last five and the guy at the desk behind them the who's in line he tells the person who is a lezzy by the way and i love how excited all of the crew are to try and get claire some but she keeps saying, don't call us Leslie's, and they're just continuing to do it. And I was like, guys, can you not? But eventually she just starts saying it anyway, herself. I This was very cute. And uh, the woman who is, or the girl, I guess, who is at the desk selling the tickets is very, like, flirty and like, hey, maybe find me at the event. And while I know that they're not supposed to be that different in ages, She looks so much older than Claire just because Claire has such a baby face. Claire looks like she's like 11 years old, you know, and I know she's meant to be like 17, 18, but I just can't keep that in mind. She looks so young that it was giving weird vibes to me all episode. Like I was happy for her, but it felt strange to watch. Nevertheless, there's a little flirting going on her saying like, maybe you should find me at the party. I'm going to be in the clown outfit. And then this dude says, they cut us. Those are supposed to be our tickets. And it turns into this girl immediately like says, I have to go talk to my manager instead of believing the girls. Because honestly, if the guy says they cut just after you say these are the last tickets, you know, he's full of shit. Like use your common sense. But I don't blame her for just being like, I'm out of it. Going to my manager, he can fucking handle you guys. And what it comes down to is this guy being like, I'm going to fight your friend for the tickets. And by your friend, he means James because he doesn't want to fight a girl. But James has absolutely no fucking interest. And I do not blame him. He thinks it's a joke initially and then realizes with growing dismay how everyone is serious. And then we cut to them outside trying to psych him up to to throw the first punch because he's at a disadvantage because this is a grown ass man. And I really did. He What he does is he sort of psychs the dude out, runs up to the girl who's holding the tickets, yanks them out of her hands And I thought he had just decided that he was going to, like, take off with them like the others do at first. And instead, he starts ripping them up. And I I was just like, James, I understand in your short-term thinking here why you thought this might work. But if you thought ahead at all, you have to realize you're still going to get your ass kicked. If you tear the tickets up, right? Like tearing them up doesn't erase the problem. It makes the problem worse, actually. And they have to flee the scene. And unfortunately, later he runs into this guy and the dude gives the whole game away. But yeah, this is, I just, 
this whole thing is so dumb. It's so dumb. So they wind up without the tickets, all lamenting how there's no way for them to go. And they, this is one of those that I'm just like, oh, it's a shame how like consistently this works. But they're at a diner talking about how badly Michelle is taking the news. James says something about how he's trying not to blame himself. And they're like, dude, you should blame yourself. You ripped the tickets up. What are you talking about? And he's like, even if I didn't, you have to know I was going to lose the fight. Oh, my God. Aaron says, but you're English, James. About five of you managed to colonize half the planet. So we know, you know, we thought you might have something hidden up your sleeve. And that, that was honestly beautiful. I loved that. So then we go to this like TV show and I don't know if this is a real show or not. It's being hosted by a little person, um, but I can't tell if it's like an, it, uh, like a regular talk show or if it's like, it sort of felt like the type of thing that set up like Good Morning America where you have various guests on and occasionally go to regular news because there's a mention of like um the the parade happening and everything um and <laughs> Michelle is on this show telling this terrible sob story about how her cousin who isn't very smart not much to look at really just doesn't have a lot going for him and ugh i don't know how to say this he's english And the host reached over and says, I'm so sorry. (laughs) Oh, God, it's so good, you guys. She tells them that he got jumped on the way to buy tickets and that they stole his money. And, of course, the show winds up being like, we not only got you tickets, And got all your friends tickets. But we also got you the VIP experience. And I love Michelle just being like, wow, I had no idea that going on TV with the sob story might possibly lead to such a thing. Y'all, I can't get mad at this con. Truly, I can't. This is the kind of scam I'm here for. Like, honestly, I have a hard time getting mad at certain types of scammers because really like who who's the victim in the end sometimes if they're scamming like old people or regular people who just have limited funds all right that's not cool but if you're scamming like corporations or rich people i just don't really give a shit it's fine in my opinion and so michelle doing this i'm honestly all for it I I love this for her. And I, I'm just so mad at the fact that James doesn't like keep it in mind in the midst of that fight. Because what could have happened is he could have got his ass kicked by this dude again. And then maybe something even they could have gotten something even better because the guy who had gotten beat up once just got his ass kicked again in their show. That could have been leveraged very well. But it doesn't work out this way. So Michelle does this genius thing, manages to get them all tickets. And because it's going to be like, uh, you know, on Halloween, they all have to come up with costumes. So they decide that they're going to do a an angel costume like from uh, Romeo and Juliet, the Baz Luhrmann Romeo and Juliet. I was really surprised that they all wore the same costume. I thought it was going to be that, you know, Aaron was saying what she would wear and then they would all sort of do something themed around that. But no, that is, uh, everybody, including James winds up with this outfit and James has the like crutches in order to emphasize that he is very, uh, he's, he's really been injured by what happened. I also want to mention too, that while they're all wearing like stark white, uh, 
Claire has a like rainbow collar on her shirt and a rainbow flag pendant uh, around her neck. And James has rainbows on each of his lapels. So there's a little bit of a like pride thing happening here and I'm here for it. Um, so they go to get picked up by Claire's dad and he's in this tiny car and apparently he had used to have a van and he's talking about just layering them all into the back of the car, like plywood basically. But eventually it's like, actually, since y'all are dressed up and this is a pretty big deal, maybe we should do something a little bit different. So the next scene we see is them getting pulled in like a trailer behind his car in the parade, open top, like, and it's the sweetest thing, you guys. He's driving and he looks back at Claire and she gives him this big thumbs up and he smiles at her and he looks so like happy that she's happy. There's just this indulgence to the look. And I had a moment of genuine like, oh, maybe we'll get to see more of the two of them. I should have realized what they were doing. I should have realized. So they get to the thing. They're being brought in to the VIP experience. It is there is this guy who says he wants to be called Fifi and he is wearing the most amazing, like clueless level yellow plaid outfit. This dude, I swear he is great. And he is all about the VIP experience for them, but they realize Claire is missing. And it turns out that it's because she went trying to find her new girlfriend. She is going around looking through at all the clowns and everybody is dressed as a clown. There's like so many of them that she has no idea who is who and begins panicking and that all the girls decide to help her and start pulling masks off and she doesn't find them. The wrong mask gets pulled off by James and he winds up in this big fight and is running around without his fucking crutches, giving away the game. So security has to grip them all up and carry them out. And I love Fifi just being like those lying little shits. I was like, look, I know that they genuinely are lying little shits, but, but don't talk about them like that. So she, she is about to get dragged out and the girl that Claire is into, I can't remember if we ever learned her name. Uh, she is at the door about to come in and asks Claire, like, what, why are you getting kicked out? It's a pity because I was sort of planning on kissing you tonight. And as much as I am rooting for Claire with this, there's a big part of me that was sort of like, y'all talked for like 10 seconds. Really? Is that, I mean... You know, okay. I mean, it's fine, but also, okay, well, that was very fast. I'm not mad about it, but it, it just felt very fast. Um, although I guess there is like a stereotype about lesbians moving very fast. I don't know. You, uh, your mileage may vary. So anyway, of course, Claire is just delighted. And it's like, was that a joke? Because if it was a joke, it was super funny. But then this girl just grabs her and kisses her right there. And it's like, just again, so adorable. But Claire seems so young and it was very weird to me. But I'm very happy for her nevertheless. And then does this mean we're going steady? And the girl's like, let's just see how it goes. So they get pulled out of there as the, the concert is finally starting. And they're outside starting to wonder like how the, this there's first a really beautiful like moment of all of Claire's friends cheering over the fact that she got kissed and they're high fiving and they are just thrilled for her. It is so adorable. I love it so much. But then Jerry comes up and the look on his face 
Oh, it was rough, you guys. It. He really, he looks like a man who has been crying. And he says, Claire, love, your dad. And then we smash cut to the hospital. And Claire is with him in the room, apparently, because it's just the other four sitting out on the bench talking about aneurysms and that they don't know what it means, how bad it could be. Orla continuing to say he's going to be okay, though, isn't he? And then we have Claire stepping out into the hall with them and crying and just shaking her head. She just she doesn't say anything. She just shakes her head. And it is truly horrible. But also, I love that all of her friends are here and they all just immediately gather around her. And there's this really sweet shot from above of Orla, like wrapping her wings around all of them. And it was just so like moving that she had everybody as somebody who lost her dad really suddenly. It was a complete shock. It is like there's just such a sense of it being deeply unfair. I mean, you know, and I wasn't even this young. It's just he and he was right there with her earlier that night. Like it was, that's the thing when it's sudden like that, they, they were up and moving around and now they're gone and it doesn't make any sense. Death doesn't make sense. It really doesn't. And then we cut to the funeral and all of them leaving and they use this fucking slowed down acoustic version. I have to celebrate you, baby. I have to praise you like I should. And it was so effective. Like, I feel like I have seen shows do this where they use like a slowed version of a song later on and they're trying to make and it doesn't work a lot for me. But man, this one fucking hit. It was a mean spirited thing. And this the episode ends with the procession out the gates of the church after the funeral, they're carrying his casket to the cemetery, I'm assuming. And all of her friends gathered around her, Claire sobbing, her mother is supported by Mary and Sarah. And honestly, y'all, this really was so hard to watch. And I'm wondering if like, I don't remember if this is the last season of the show. Um, I think it is right. This is the final season, but I I'm really curious what effect this is going to have on the final episode, because this is a hell of a thing to happen right before the, the season ends and potentially the series ends. So, Oh God, everybody's acting though. And like, I just love how there for her they all are. And I'm so glad for Claire that she has them because the support when you've lost somebody, it's tough because like no one's ever able to really get what you're going through until they go through it. So there is a, a sense of being isolated no matter what, because it's just that they can only join you in your grief to a degree, but them being there it it still matters and changes things you know I had uh when my father died it was during a point with me and Brendan where we were really really broke and I had to get back to Connecticut for the funeral and it was un like uncertain how we were going to get there and how it, we didn't have a car at the time and I had to go in like the middle of the night and uh, his family chipped in to get me the the train ticket. And then my friend Mary, who wound up coming to my wedding also, um, my wedding recently, I mean, she got up at like three in the morning to drive me to the train station to, to go. And it was just such a like kind thing, you know? Um, and it, all that kind of people just putting themselves out to make things a little easier for you. It really matters and adds up a lot. And 
especially because we only in this episode and the last really got to see all that much of her father. I don't know if there were other moments with him in previous seasons that I've kind of forgotten, but it, it really, I, I can't help but like be envious of how lovely the last moments she had with him were him pulling her in this parade and doing this thing for her and her friends. That is a great last memory to have, you know, and I think about sometimes how my father had called me and I just had a really brief phone conversation with him because I was busy and I didn't have a lot of time to talk. And I think sometimes about how much I took for granted that I would be able to call him back later. And that did not happen. So at least having a really amazing final memory is something she can hold on to. Doesn't make it easier, but it makes things feel like there's some closure in a way that, you know, not, not everybody gets. Um, Austin says we briefly saw him in season one in the first episode. Okay. So yeah, really rough ending to this episode, especially for Claire having just had her first kiss and it being such a high point to be faced with this. She's really going through a lot in a, in a short time, you know? So yeah, I, uh, Oh God, I'm just really, I was not ready for this. I'm not, I was not ready for it. <sighs> All right. Well, I'm going to have to wrap up, but thank you guys a lot for listening. Thank you, Ashley, for commissioning this. Thank you to Miss T and Austin for hanging out in the chat with me. Appreciate you both. And until next time, toodaloo, motherfuckers. <laughs>